Moses' tabernacle and Solomon's temple compose the two most prominent architectural buildings in the Bible. While directed by God, they were not buildings like we would expect from some ancient alien civilization. They had many of the same functions and styles of other temples and tabernacles of the surrounding culture near ancient Israel. Today we're going to look at how the tabernacle and the temple were very similar to ancient Egyptian temples in the structure, practice, and symbolism that accompanied them. Note that this will not be terribly extensive as that would make this video way longer than I would ever hope and I'm sure you would too. But it should give you a taste of what was going on in the mind of the ancient Israelite. So with that out of the way, let's get our stereotypical, unrealistic archaeologist clothing on. Let's do this. First of all, we have to talk about what was the temple and tabernacle. Essentially, they were sacred space. It was where God or the gods of other cultures were said to be in the same presence. It was the meeting of heaven and earth. Moses' tabernacle and Solomon's temple were broken up into three main areas, the outer courtyard, the inner sanctuary, and the holy of holies. It was not only a place of sacrifice, but also a place for the Israelites to assemble together. Egypt's temples had very similar functions, as we will discuss. They were much more complex than just three main components and often got extremely huge. Egyptian temples often had many rooms, but still one main inner sanctuary. The most important part of the temple where the idol of the Egyptian temple will be placed. As the Egyptologist Dr. David Falk notes, Egypt and Israel shared a common idea of sacred space. They also could multiply the effect of holiness and sacredness. And how they did this was they would put one holy space inside of another to create a more holy space. Nesting these spaces inside of each other was how they created holy of holies. So then when we look at the Bible and the scenes of the tabernacle, we see that there's not one, but two tents. You have the, the outer tent, but you also had an inner tent. And inside the inner tent was the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. Even in the temple in Jerusalem, you had the, the three courts. You had the, the court of the women, the court of the men, and the court of the priests. But inside the court of the priests was the temple itself, and inside the temple itself was another section of sacred space called the Holy of Holies that was surrounded by a veil. Each layer of holy space added multiplied holiness. One of the biggest standout features for the temple of the ancient Egyptian was what it represents. Dr. Richard Wilkinson notes, in the world of giant metaphors, which was the Egyptian temple, each element in the overall architectural program played a role in symbolizing some aspect of the origins and function of the cosmos itself. We also see this idea directly described in the depictions of Jewish writers as well as early church writers like Philo. One of those was Josephus, who described the temple in marvelous terms. To those of whom this sounds crazy, People of this time weren't as concerned with the material world that we can feel and touch, like we are in the 21st century. They were primarily concerned with the real meaning behind the material. This will be important as many Old Testament scholars argue that the temple and the tabernacle for the Israelites was seen as a representation of the cosmos. We don't have time to go into all the details today, but we will discuss this in the future. To start how the Egyptians mirrored the cosmos with their temples, first of all, they had many columns. Now the crowded halls of columns also held symbolic meanings. In Egyptian mythology, the celestial realm of the sky was supported above the earth on columns which are shown as a framing device in the sides of the temple representations. These columns were mirrored off what they saw as the original creation of the world, where the primordial mount was a marshy environment. Speaking of the marsh, their marsh plant environment was a big focus to them. The lower sections of the temple walls were also often decorated with the representations of marsh plants, and the entire effect was considerably heightened in temples where the outer courts and pillared hall were actually flooded. 
sometimes by design, get that. In the annual inundation of the Nile, in other words, the annual flooding of the Nile. In most Egyptian temples, the height of the various architectural elements gradually decreased towards the rear of the temple, while the floor level gradually rose towards the raised inner sanctuary. Symbolically, this was consistent with the lower marsh-like environment surrounding the primeval mound that rose from the waters at the world's beginning. Just like the Egyptians, Solomon's temple was a journey back in time to the original world that was created. The temple and tabernacle was seen as a blast from the past of the Garden of Eden with cherubim on the walls on the ark and veil, palm trees on the walls, a seven-branch candle made to look like the tree of life. Egyptians also had sacred water pools that were used for rituals as places for the priests to ritually cleanse themselves and as representations of the primordial waters from which the world emerged. Now regarding the tabernacle and temple of the Israelites where Israelites would ritually cleanse themselves. The bronze sea of the temple represented the sea gathered together into one place as the waters were in Genesis 1-9. Now let's talk about altars. Altars were sometimes placed in the room preceding the sanctuary and in some cases this room was used as an offering hall in Egyptian temples where the sacrifices of the gods were made. Michael Jones adds some similarities with the altar, tent poles, priestly linens, priestly garments, style of the encampment of Israel, priestly duties, and many more. Other cultic features from the Exodus narrative also fit within Egyptian culture. When the Israelites made furniture for the tabernacle, they followed Egyptian techniques. In Exodus 27, the altar is said to have horns on it, which fits with the Egyptian description of altars from the Tutmos side period and afterwards. The altar of the tabernacle was metal laid over a wooden base. This is a common practice found among the Egyptians, who rarely made altars out of stone. The pair of cherubs facing each other fits with Egyptian chess from the time of Amenhotep III onward. Later during the time of Ramesses II, a type of Egyptian furniture called a palanquin throne, which was an exposed throne, often were made with winged goddesses protecting each side of the throne. Hofmeyer lists other Egyptian aspects for the design of the tabernacle. Many of the wooden objects, like the tent poles, were overlaid with a gold foil, which was a technique mastered in Egypt. The word for the priest's linen in the book of Exodus stems from an Egyptian loanword, suggesting an early in Egyptian origin for the priest's linen in the Exodus account. The priests also were to wear undergarments to cover their privates. Undergarments were discovered in tombs of priests in Egypt. The menorah and firepan appear to have had some Egyptian influence, and many of the words used in describing the priest's attire seem to have come from Egyptian words. Even the encampment of Israel fits with a Ramazide time period. Ramesses' military camps were set up in a rectangular fashion, with an entrance in the middle of the eastern wall. The pharaoh resided in the middle with a reception tent, and his throne was symbolized with two falcons facing each other with their wings spread out. The Book of Numbers states Israel encamped in a similar fashion, with the ark in the center, which had two winged cherubs on it. Joshua Berman says, the military camp at Kadesh constitutes the closest parallel to the tabernacle, including the Temple of Solomon, known to date. The tent of Yahweh, the divine warrior, parallels the tent of the Pharaoh, the living Egyptian god, posed for battle. Now the tops of the Egyptian temples were sometimes covered in stars. A great many features of the late developed temple reflect the same idea of the domain of the god as a created world in a microcosm. The temple roof was the heaven of this model world, and as such was usually decorated with stars and flying birds. The floor correspondingly was regarded as the great marsh from which the primeval world arose, and the great columns of the pillared courts and halls were made to represent palm, lotus, or papyrus plants with their intricately worked capitals, depicting the leaves or flowers of these species. Just as the elements of the structural design seem to have symbolized the original creation of the world according to the ancient Egyptian, aspects of the temple's symbolism represented the ongoing functioning of the cosmos by reflecting the sun's diurnal cycle. The entrance pylons were built to mirror the form of the hieroglyph Aket, or in other words, horizon, on which the sun rose each day. 
So we see a reference to the past, but also parts of the temple representing what would happen every day. The main processional path of the temple thus replicated the course of the sun in its daily journey across the world, rising above the pylons in the east, moving through the columned halls and courts where its image appears under the lintels and architraves, and setting finally in the west where the inner sanctuary was situated. The gradually decreasing height of the various elements of the standard temple plan towards the rear mimicked this movement, and in most cases, the various areas became increasingly less well lit until almost complete darkness was reached in the shrine, the Holy of Holies itself in the east. Now like the Egyptians, the Holy of Holies for the temple and tabernacle for the Israelites was also supposed to be dark. The reasoning is different though. The Egyptian temples were often open to the sun, but the angle of the sun often prevented it from shining in. On the other hand, the temple and tabernacle were blocked off by the sun because they were indoors and were lit by lamps instead. Dr. Wilkinson notes that only in the Amarna period during the 18th dynasty was this principle reversed when the heretic Akhenaten effectively turned the Egyptian temple program inside out by designing the great temple of the Aten at Amarna to progress from relative darkness into totally unshaded light. Unless something similar existed at Heliopolis, this radical shift from the normal temple plan did not survive Akhenaten himself and appears to have left little in the way of lasting influence. As was previously mentioned, according to the Egyptian worldview, the temple stood at the nexus of the three spheres of heaven, earth, and the netherworld, and it thus served as a kind of portal by which gods might pass from one realm to the other. Sorry, I had to take off my jacket. This Egyptian heat is really difficult. Anyways, as was previously mentioned, according to the Egyptian worldview, the temple stood at the nexus of the three spheres of heaven, earth, and the netherworld, and it thus served as a kind of portal by which gods might pass from one realm to the other. In the same way that the temple pylon functions symbolically as an aket or horizon in terms of the solar cycle, so the whole temple functioned as a kind of temporal and spatial aket, just as the physical horizon is the interface between heaven and earth, and in terms of the setting sun between today and tomorrow, the present and future this world and the beyond so the temple. Of whatever type was regarded as an aket or interface between these spheres or rams and was often described as such. Now Dr. Benjamin Kilker notes that the tabernacle and temple of the Israelites was the opposite of how the Egyptians typically were. And it's also interesting uh, because all temples, uh, the tabernacle, the Solomonic temple, the Ezekiel temple, they all, all look westwards. Um, the Holy of Holies is always in the West. Temples in the ancient Near East were usually uh, e oriented to the East, to the rising sun. But uh, Israel uh, shows the rising sun its back and looks uh, to God because uh, the sun is only, again, we have this in the in Genesis 1, it, the sun is not God. It is only a lamp that God puts uh, on the on the sky and therefore they shall not pray to the sun but they shall uh, leave the rising sun in their back and look to uh, to God. This brings us to the doorway of the temple. The doors of the temple had significance as important thresholds of other worlds or states. Doors are commonly shown in representations of the shrines of gods and the ritual act of opening these doors was symbolic of the opening of the doors of heaven itself. The false doors, on the other hand, found in many temples held the same significance as a threshold to the divine. Now these false doors were doors that didn't open which were seen as a way for gods to come into the divine realm. They were essentially a wall. We see something similar here with the temple and tabernacle as they are places where God can be present. It is where the Israelites would be able to give back to God's divine presence they had been missing since the beginning in Eden. Wilkinson also adds something that was very common in the ancient Near East. Food was given to idols. Like they were actually given to feed the idols. While there was bread in the temple and tabernacle, this is a bit different than how the Bible describes the food. The writers of the Bible never describe the food as being food for God. Now, the Ark of the Covenant also has very distinct similarities with sacred Egyptian furniture. My friend Michael Jones relays this data from Egyptologist David Falk. The Ark was constructed by borrowing elements from numerous features found in Egyptian ritualistic furniture. 
occultic chests appear frequently in Egyptian history and were often used for transporting sacred objects and had long removable poles attached to the base. Often they were wood boxes covered with gold inside and out, had a sacred cloth draped over them, and had a lid with sacred statuary like the mercy seat. Yet these features are also seen in the construction of the Ark. In ancient Egypt, building shrines for the gods was very important, and often the Egyptians would construct special shrines called barks, modeled after boats. Egyptian priests would transport the idol in a bark. The Ark didn't contain an idol on top of it, but Dr. Falk notes it also contains similar features to Egyptian shrines and barks. It functioned as a shrine where God would meet with the children of Israel. The Ark is an ideal fit as ritual processional furniture and follows an Egyptian design pattern. Was the Ark a bark, a coffin, a chest, a reliquary, or a throne? Yes, and so much more. Finally, I want to end with the image of the God that was in Egyptian temples. This was placed in the Holy of Holies, you know, the, the biggest deal of the temple. But there could also be depictions or images of the God in other places throughout and outside the temple. This is very different than what was in ancient Israelite sacred places, you know, the temple and tabernacle. There was no image of God, no idol for Yahweh, because the Israelites thought he was too great for that. At the same time, in a way, there was an image in the temple and tabernacle. While it wasn't something that the people worshipped, the priests were themselves images of God because humanity was made in the image of God in Genesis 1 and 2. As we've discussed, the temple and tabernacle of Israel had quite a few similarities with Egyptian temples. This should be no surprise as the writers of the Bible portray themselves as being fully immersed in their ancient Near Eastern world. Does that mean we must conclude that the Israelites copied other architecture and customs of other cultures? Not necessarily. The endless amounts of scholars and I would argue that God accommodated to the time and thought process of the peoples of the day in the best way that they would be able to understand what God was communicating to them. If you feel uneasy about it, make sure to check out my video with Pastor Kyle from Beneath the Bible where we discuss questions about the ancient Near Eastern context of the Bible. If you found this helpful, please make sure to like and subscribe as I'll be going into greater detail over the ancient Israelite cosmic view of their temple and tabernacle, how it relates to Genesis, as well as how Israel had very similar customs with other parts in the ancient world. So yeah, like and subscribe. Let me know what I missed. This is what your archaeologist didn't tell you.